Hi, my name is Claire Alston, and I am the Membership and Operations Manager for the CPR Institute. If you enjoy the program this week, you will love our member exclusive programming throughout the year. One of the member exclusives that we're launching is an informal chat series. Our first member chat will be held on March 23rd from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll be talking about committees, so if you are curious about getting more involved with CPR, this will be a great time to hop on Zoom for a few minutes and have a chat with us. But right now, though, I'm very excited to introduce our next moderated discussion on dispute prevention. Dispute prevention is a major focus for CPR, and we even have a dispute prevention pledge that you can check out on our website. Today's discussion will be featuring companies and how different companies in different industries leverage technology to mitigate risk and prevent disputes. This discussion will be moderated by Janice Spiro, who brings a wealth of ADR experience spanning 35 years and over 450 arbitrations. You can find Ms. Spiro on CPR's panel of distinguished neutrals. So without further ado, I'll let her get this started. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. That was very insightful to listen to the general counsel of Microsoft because responsibility is hand in hand with advancements. And I love that approach. Um, we have a dynamic group and rather than keep talking, I'm going to go right in and introduce them and let them do the talking. Uh, first up, we have Amy Young is general counsel and chief privacy officer at Lotemain. After a very successful law practice in the law firm arena, she became assistant general counsel for ZeniMax, a global video platform and publisher. She then moved to an AI platform of data miner during its mid-market expansion and rode that all the way to Deputy uh, General Counsel at Cornscore, Comscore, excuse me, where she was integral to involving and evolving the company into first rate compliance, uh, which is not where it actually started when she joined. And in alignment with the new and upcoming privacy regulations, in addition to shepherding the launch of Comscore's products. Uh, frankly, it's no wonder that Lotomain snapped her up when they did. So she is a delight to have on our panel. Like uh, Amy, Chris Nelson uh, is no stranger to big data. Chris leads the data and operations team, or called DOT, for Microsoft's compliance and ethics um, organization, which has primary, primary responsibility for workplace and business conduct investigations. Um, DOT brings together data analysts, program managers, and legal professions. So it's a, it's a cross skill group that together design and operate systems and solutions that increase the effectiveness of investigations. They translate those learnings into data driven insights and then build predictive models and analytics that help the company mitigate emerging compliance risk. Chris uh, is also, you know, he's a busy guy too. He's also a core member of Microsoft's anti-corruption technology and solutions program, which is a 10 year effort to bend the curve of corruption, which is frankly, very, very important by delivering expertise in anti corruption technology to government. So he's directly involved in helping uh, foreign nations and governments deal with corruption and predictors of corruption. On the other side of the coin, protecting that new technology, we have Kenneth O. He's a privacy and interoperability attorney with over 25 years of experience. He was a former trademark examiner with the US Patent and Trademark Office also previously of counsel with Baker and Hostetter, where he advised clients on intellectual property issues, litigated cases, and frequently appeared before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. He then served as a general, excuse me, as Associate General Counsel at Walmart and uh, at 
a, oops, excuse me, and assistant vice president for privacy and compliance. Since then, he's been again snapped up <laughs> by Bath and Body Works, where he again is the assistant vice president for privacy, working directly with the general counsel. In another industry, handling large government and other contracts, we have Nick is a staff vice president and associate general counsel at General Dynamics Corporation, where he specifically advises on many of the company's most significant litigation and disputes. In his role as associate general counsel, Nick works regularly on identifying and avoiding potential risks and disputes. Prior to joining General Dynamics, uh, Nick was a partner at Jenner and Block, where he focused on internal investigations and commercial litigation. And I have had the pleasure personally of working with Nick on the Dispute Prevention Committee. So I can tell you that he, he knows his stuff. As you can see, we have a very large, wide range of industries represented from retail sales to data solutions to technology services and even the defense industry. Yet, despite their differences, every single one of these industries and panelists have one key innovation in common. They are leaders in using technology to prevent disputes and mitigate risk. I want you to join me in welcoming our panel of thought leaders. I know people can't really hear clapping over Zoom, but it's still the gesture that counts. I'm gonna start with uh, some questions and you know, everybody just join in the conversation. First, let's talk about and share with us how your company currently uses technology to prevent disputes and avoid risks. Do you wanna lead us off, Chris? Sure, thanks Janice and really a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, so I'll just take a couple minutes and give you an overview. Um, so we're aggressive users of technology inside the company at Microsoft um, to fuel uh, our compliance programs um, and also critically to drive culture around um, accountability and business ownership of risk. Um, and we do this in several ways, but one of the, mo the, the most critical is increasing the use of data and data fluency on the legal and compliance side so that when we go in and have discussions with risk owners and broader communities who are you know, day to day managing risks and facing those risks, we're able to come to them in a language that they're familiar speaking if it's a business team who's you know, focused on uh, you know, metrics that are data oriented. It's just much easier to connect with them if we speak that same language of data and we can translate um, what are typically or historically anyway, um, subjective sort of descriptions of risks and risk profiles into actual quantified objective indicators with visualizations to show and explain why a risk is trending high or low relative to the rest of the world. And so that ability to come at a risk holistically across our entire business and historically over time really lets us do that powerful thing of saying, hey, this is what normal looks like, or this is what the range of normal looks like for this particular factor. And you guys are outside of it or you're within it and you know, keep doing this or let's, let's try something different. So I, I, I'd say it's, it's that sort of broad motion that um, it, has been the most powerful for us. Thank you, Chris. I think that's very dynamic in the sense of working with management and the language that they speak to really achieve common goals of using data proactively. Amy, I know you're also with big data. Share with us what your company does to prevent uh, disputes. Sure, I'd be happy to do that, as well as some of the other experiences that, that I bring to the table. Um, because, of course, at my current company, Lodemy, we uh, build together and pull in together a lot of big data sets that help other companies uh, evaluate the circumstances at hand. Uh, the primary use case scenario is actually largely on the commercial side and in particular when it comes to targeted advertising. But the truth of the matter is 
the data sets can also be used and are used for a, num a number of other internal as well as external risk factors and considerations. Um, for example, uh, some of the um, insurance companies use this to round out some of the context that their already great modeling um, behaviors and data sets uh, already share with them, but for which can be helpful in terms of um, benchmarking and, and um, looking through some of the implicit biases. Uh, some of the other companies like, for example, in the financial sector, again, um, can, be, can help reduce risk in the way in which they they look to branch out their, their companies. And of course, the same goes for a number of other consumer um, organizations. Prior to this role, I too um, spent time as Janice thoughtfully um, identified at both Comscore, which is of similar um, sentiment, as well as at, at Data Miner, which has a narrower use case scenario. So I'll use that because it also applies to all of the companies that I've been with that I've described um, thus far. And data miner uses a lot of social media based data to create big data sets. Uh, and the use case there is actually um, unique. And, and I know Chris has a lot of experience with this as well in that uh, this information can actually be used uh, first and foremost on the ground with corporations, just like right now in the Ukraine situation to help their people get out, move around, get information in a timely fashion, see what's on the ground um, as well as other um, large-scale operations, Europol, Home Office, um, other governmental bodies that then can help understand risk and minimize that risk within their own um, companies. Some of this is anticipatory, so after being able to take a look at these data sets, they can then put in place policies that adjust. They can put in place trainings that make a lot of sense for em their employees. And of course, there's the um, uh, ideal, not ideal, but um, the use case scenario that most people are familiar with, which is in the moment of crisis, such as in Ukraine, journalists, um, security forces, and individuals who have access can, can see what other social media posts, what other um, information is being provided to them at that moment in real time to then be able to make the, the decisions best able for themselves. And so many companies, by definition, purchase this on behalf of their employees, particularly those in global workforces, because you can't always have your eyes to the ground in every single moment, even when you are as expansive as, expansive as we've just heard um, from Microsoft's general counsel, as Microsoft is and has the capability and resources to be able to do it. So this is a little bit of a, of a product that can help at least um, share which way the winds are blowing. I love that real-time aspect. You know, uh, given, given shipping industry, for example, knowing what the weather pattern is going to be, a tsunami in Japan, wildfires in California, on the ground real-time, not only helps you mitigate you know, risk, but literally helps prevent disputes because you can circle around that environment and hopefully have an alternative route. Ken, do you wanna tell us how your company uses uh, technology currently to avoid disputes and mitigate risk? Well, sure. So, so I'll begin by saying that I think a lot of us grew up in the old days where, where we just put things on Outlook calendar and, and really did it old school way. Uh, I know I did, you know, but I think now, I mean, there's so much technology. I mean, um, you know, when, when I did IP, you had to have a docking system and they're just getting more and more sophisticated uh, where all the information is kind of stored centrally. Uh, AI start to look into the, to the data and help you to populate information. Uh, you know, when you do privacy, I, I don't know how you can do privacy law without uh, accessing a lot of these um, third-party vendors out there who have you know, great softwares. Uh, one thing I, I recommend to everybody is when you go to these conferences, you know, talk to these vendors, because some of the technology is simply amazing. Uh, some of the capabilities outstanding. And frankly, it's just keep getting better. I, I truly believe that if you don't keep up with the technology, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice because things will take slower. Uh, you'll have to do things manually, which, which will cause more errors. So I mean, for, for us, you know, we use uh, a privacy software called uh, OneTrust, but you know, there's others out there. You know, some of them have robotic automations, and, uh, different AIs. Uh, so, so, so I mean, in my world, uh, I, I look at, test, 
uh, test drive all sorts of different software uh, because it's just keep getting better and better. I love the concept of keeping up with the technology. I think the pandemic has taught us that those who were Zoom knowledgeable were able to jump into Zoom or virtual hearings. Those who were not used to video conferencing, whether it's Zoom or some other platform, had a harder learning curve. And so even in, in my industry, being able to arbitrate, I'm a full-time arbitrator and mediator, getting up to speed on Zoom was, was vital. I don't know that I would have been able to keep so busy the last couple of years if I didn't. Nick, jump in here. Tell us how General Dynamics uses uh, technology currently to avoid disputes. Janice, thanks. And, and thank you again for, for having me uh, here. It's um, I, just to step back a little bit. When we think about preventing disputes, we sort of try to think about managing the root causes of them. And three of the ones that we really think a lot about are uh, sort of bad business partners, bad assumptions, or bad contract terms as sort of the drivers or the root causes of the disputes that we see arising across our various businesses. And we try to use technology, of course, in different ways, depending on the different, those different causes in order to, to manage them. But you know, one example is the technology-aided due diligence, right, that can aggregate, identify, uh, issues associated with third parties or potential business partners, potential suppliers in ways that manual review just might not be able to do. And that can help us avoid getting into uh, relationships that we don't want to, and it can cause problems down the line. Um, it's one way to do it. We obviously try to uh, bring the technology to bear in, in other areas as well. I know that General Dynamics is really big on transparency. And one of the things that as you were talking, hit my brain was, you know, you have Microsoft talking about responsibility. And if you're looking at data to determine partnering with co other companies, if you have that value and you share that value, you can more easily align yourself with a company that's equally as transparent and believes in responsibility as General Dynamics does. So thanks for that. I wanted to now ask another question. Dispute prevention in my mind looks both backwards and forwards. And what do I mean by that? It looks backwards in that we, we hope to learn lessons from our past disputes, avoid repeating them and, and basically learn the lesson from that dispute to not have it reoccur. It also has a, a forward looking aspect in that we want to use data to predict potential problems and then come up with solutions for how to avoid them. So I'm going to ask, you know, Chris to lead us off on this. How has your company used technology both backwards to prevent repeat problems, but also forward to avoid future risks? Yeah, thanks, Jazz. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, um, you know, I, it's impossible to do this without data. Um, you know, there's, there's, we've had a multi-year journey figuring out how to um, accurately and consistently capture learnings from disputes, whether it's workplace investigations or it's corruption cases. Um, and then apply those, sort of hone the, the learnings into something that is you know, more like a compass that you can use reliably to point you to other places. In the case of serial risks, most risks, um, or a lot of risks anyway, tend to be serial and repeat, repeating by nature. Um, and, and then, um, you know, not, not, and then feed, feeding those learnings back into teams to go out and be proactive about getting in front of things before you have a whistleblower case, right? And this is really the, the big evolution, I would say, of our compliance efforts and dispute resolution efforts in this space. And Microsoft has been, I mean, reactive is critical. We have hotlines. We have a dozen ways you can reach us with um, ethical concerns and complaints, both employees and non-employees alike. Um, this is going to be even more critical as the EU whistleblower directive rolls out over the next couple of years. 
Um, and, and, but that's not enough or it's not sufficient to do what you described, right? So if you, if all you're doing is reacting, um, even if you're learning as you're reacting, if you're not applying that learning to take other steps, proactive steps, um, you know, I, I think you're not fulfilling the opportunity in front of us with both, when both data and tech come together. And so that's really what I, what I would highlight is figuring out how to reliably get those, extract those insights, you know, whether it's a post-mortem, whether it's a slide deck and you're in, but there's single points of accountability to make sure every single time you do something, you intervene in a reactive posture, you're taking away something from it. And then you have a team of people, um, you know, it could be a vendor or it could be a technology platform to, um, to Ken, Kenneth's point, like, it, you know, technology is often a substitute in this context for people, but either way, you're, you're not just sort of dropping it or, you know, you know, losing that insight, you're actually doing something to apply it where you can. That's really been the secret of our evolution. That's to me very meaningful because I remember before I defected to the neutral role, I was a, a litigator with Morrison and Forrester. And one of the things that, you know, we routinely did was a forward looking approach where we would go into companies and do basically a legal audit. Like, where do we see potential problems and risks for you? Working very closely with the risk manager. And at the same time, we do the what I used to call the the legal autopsy, which is what happened? How did we end up here and in this expensive, ridiculous litigation? And so I appreciate what you're talking about in terms of both uh, learning those lessons and moving forward. Amy, I know you share the same view. Can you can you fill us in a little bit more on what you're currently working on in that area that's both forward and backwards looking? Yeah, very much so. And and um, I share your observations as well as Chris's on the postmortems. I find them to be crucial both, you know, on an individual level as a manager, on the enterprise level as a company, and then frankly, as a strategic component of our, our product map um, and roadmap, it's essential to be able to get um, and incorporate that feedback that comes comes through and and I think on the commercial side, starting with that first, um, undoubtedly clients of our company use our data to be able to help benchmark, do those checks, frankly, um, do some of those gut checks because even when you think you're on the right path, um, being able to have some sort of independent validation of that um, is really helpful, um, especially when as Chris mentions, talking about those big data sets and being able to utilize them in a fashion that uh, is risk reducing rather than in a way that in unintentionally creates more risk. Um, some of that very risk that Nick in his root cause analysis ends up uh, <laughs> ends up um, inadvertently creating. So that that I think from a commercial standpoint is, is certainly from you know one of those considerations that that um, I think of and, and that we think of here at Lodemy. Uh, and then in terms of past disputes and, and avoiding repeating them, uh, we implement a fair amount of technology, including just in the legal team, to be able to, um, you know, I call it hold ourselves accountable. Um, there, there are so many different types of tools out there these days. I was just on a Kanban board um, a few minutes ago um, before, before the conference started. There are other types of ways in which one can document uh, and since there are many lawyers here, <laughs> in, in um, uh, risk-reduced, privileged, approached ways uh, that still make sure that the way in which a company is moving forward and the way in which a legal team is moving forward doesn't otherwise drop inadvertently some of the, some of the um, areas that somebody has then identified as an area of risk going forward. Um, I find that historically speaking, this area, whether or not you're you're using um, using Microsoft technology, for example, or uh, Jira, you know, Atlassian, there there are a number of products out there these days that make it really, really easy and very consumer friendly to even those who aren't very technical at all to be able to put those in and at least use it as, as, if you will, a movable whiteboard that keeps us all accountable um, to avoid repeating those mistakes. And that's, you know, 
maybe it's a little meta, but that's technology within the technology to, to help ensure that your organization um, takes the observations that, that we as humans synthesize together. And then we make sure that we actually implement in, in a way going forward, whether or not it's contracts, whether or not it's that litigation dispute or otherwise. You know, I, I love that concept and, and you both seem to focus on the same idea of serial risk. You know, as soon as I hear the word serial, I, I think, and no, not Captain Crunch, I think serial killer, right? And so serial risk is like the thing that's gonna do your company in if you don't recognize it and stop it. Uh, or at least mitigate it as much as possible. Um, what are some of the most underused technologies that we currently have available in the corporate world that could really, really work well with preventing disputes and mitigating risks that are just, they're just underutilized? Nick, lead us off on that. What else could we be doing? Sure, thanks. Uh, well, one thing that I think is, um, is a, is a bit underutilized is the tech for preventing disputes is the technology that the business already dis deploys across its business as it monitors and and you know uh, operates uh, its core you know business objectives. I mean, our business, for example, largely involves executing on very large contracts, either for government customers or sometimes for for private customers uh, in the aerospace uh, area, but. Uh, regardless, usually large contracts that involve a long period of performance and a dispute or even a financial issue with that is often very much a lagging indicator of other issues that have come up of one party, the other, not performing on their underlying obligations in the contract. And a bunch of the data and technology that's already being used to aggregate and analyze that data for business purposes can be used and leveraged in order to escalate potential risks uh, and avoid a dispute before it actually ripens if seen through that lens. I think that's one thing that you know, certainly we're trying to get better at as a company. And it's something that I think a lot of companies can look at what is already being used and already uh, being looked at from a, a business point of view to see how it can be repurposed and leveraged in order to reduce dispute risk or find ways to escalate things earlier to responsible business management who can then solve a problem maybe before you'd ever have to involve the lawyers in the first place. I, I love that concept because what I hear when you say that is, you know, they've already mon they've already monetized the, the technology for their business objectives. And now they could monetize the, the same technology to keep their basically legal costs down, right? I mean, it's the same concept, it still affects the bottom line. Ken, jump in here and tell us, you know, what do you see as some of the most underused technology that could be redirected and repurposed for prevention of disputes? Well, so I'm a big believer that you know, we already have a lot of great tools available to us. And, uh, you know, for instance, one of the, I think every lawyer deals with is version control. Um, and, you know, how do you manage version, version control documents? You know, how do you manage you know, docketing? And you know, there's a lot of tools out there that will help you help you with with this uh, document compare and version control, and, and making sure that you know documents are properly locked down and uh, only changes that are tracked are made. And, and I think for a lot of us, you know, we actually have a lot of the tools probably available to us. Uh, you know, Microsoft Word, I think we all use it, but but there's just so much capability in it uh, that I think a lot of people are only using a small portion of it. So so I think there's both things that we have already that we're just probably not completely using. And of course, there's ones out there, which I think you know, as we start to see more AIs and, and, and uh, more technology that's gonna help us, uh, I think when you combine the two, it, it'll just it'll give a better result, uh, both for the client and both for the other parties. And you can avoid dispute, things will be done quicker and, and it'll be tracked better. I love that concept when you said, you know, we're using only a part of the Microsoft uh, capabilities. It reminded me of that study that I read a long time ago about the human brain, how we as people on a given day are using a fraction, a minute fraction of our brain's capability. So imagine if we augmented the use of our own brains with the augmented use of technology for the 
for in a responsible way for the greater good what we would be achieving chris what do you think what technology is out there that we are not using to full advantage in corporate america to prevent disputes that we could be taking advantage of boy um it's hard to pick just one <laughs> i think the nature of the risk really has a, a big role to play in the answer in the sense that you know if you're looking at a risk that is finance related let's say it's like an aml risk or corporate fraud risk or you know something of that nature i really think you know powerful big data tools like azure synapse and you know kubernetes and like some of these like the data architecture stuff it, and the structuring of that data to like have it speak to you in the way you need it to which requires a combination of you know subject matter experts that understand how to translate that risk in from the data back and forth and then data specialists and i mean like that's that's a, a multifaceted process with lots of layers of tech um so it's hard to choose what but ju just one but then there's you know there's other kinds of risks um that you know maybe to simplify it and say like at the executive or at the leadership level if you're trying to understand you know where to deploy new controls or where to deploy new heads to manage a risk i think you know basic visualization power bi and the like um to consistently and monitor um uh, for background factors that correlate with risk not to say that you know these accurately predicting risks you have to come at that with an enormous amount of humility and curiosity and the false positive risk is through the roof um, so I think, you know, arming experts with visualizations and context from data that they can then combine with their own, you know, just deep experience as a, as a risk manager, that's probably the most powerful combination I can think of um, right now until, if we're just talking about risk in general, as opposed to something very specific like, you know, AML stuff. I, I personally think it's fascinating. I want to take one second to say the first CLE code. Everybody write this down. The first CLE code is expert because Chris just mentioned using experts. You know, one of the things that I've been fortunate to do is when I did dispute prevention for a couple uh, fighting companies, shall we say, um, we ended up bringing in an expert when instead of flying them over, we gave them a virtual tour of the site and they were able to give us an opinion right then and there. Uh, and that wouldn't have been possible without basically either augmented reality or or some type of visualization. Um, you know, we've been talking about greater advances, greater advances in technology. And it certainly has proven to give great benefits, but with greater benefits comes its own challenges, right? So what are some of the challenges and issues that you believe you faced with increased reliance on technology? And tell us how you've navigated them. Amy, I know you've dealt with this all the time. Tell us about it. <laughs> Um, it's true. I, I think, um, like with Chris, there's both the enterprise level and then there's the commercial product value. And so some of that overlaps. Um, um, I, I'll say this, the greater your footprint grows, the more resources um, you need to think about um, applying to them. So, you know, as companies thought, oh, well, we're just going to onboard email. And now you have all of this email that litigators and arbitrators alike end up <laughs> sifting through for the um, for the relevant gems, um, so goes the rest of the software in, in the company. And so the data, the data pools, um, and, and also the data architecture are paramount and the evaluation of the, of the way in which that data architecture has been built Generally speaking, with many companies, it's 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 um it's not planned uh, necessarily. It sort of at least starts ad hoc, and then it's siloed. Different departments onboard different things, and then at some point in time in the future, 
an IT or an IT sec team will come together, or then there'll be resources that then start refashioning this in a way that makes sense going forward. And that's where a lot of um, risk comes from, even with you know some of these tools that we talk about, AI, AI searching for litigation, pleadings, AI inferences for the various um, number of cases that are brought on or the keywords that, um, that are part of the settlements. Um, AI for the inferences of the big data that, that um, companies like Lonomy provides data for, these all then uh, add on and the systems add on and that alone can end up becoming a much larger enterprise level risk. And so um, I, I guess Janice, that would be that would be one one way in which um, the risk piles up and where many companies, um, may not necessarily think about this or want to append resources until at some point in time in the future. But but to be honest with you, early architecture can make this much more seamless and much more consistent in the future, including uh, an ongoing um, systemic addressing of, of the um, risk before it even occurs. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. In fact, um, Nick, I know that one of your key functions as Associate General Counsel is trying to deal with the big decisions around disputes that already exist in litigation and curtailing them. What do you see as some of the challenges that technology has brought to you in your department and how have you navigated them? How has General Dynamics dealt with the increased reliance on technology? Well, I think the one thing that, you know, is an important aspect for our company in particular uh, in uh, adoption of new technologies or the changes in, in what technology should be using or potentially leveraging new technology is, is managing some of the cultural impacts of it. We are a company that very deeply values transparency and trust between colleagues uh, we do not believe, we do not in, and we do not want, and nor do we have sort of bureaucratic checking of what other people are doing within the organization. Um, it is something that is antithetical to the way we want to run the company and the way that we do. And But then in order to implement new things within our culture requires an emphasis on alignment and trust with colleagues uh, and can require navigating things a little bit differently doing simply a data call in order to get additional information or to say this new technology is something that would be appropriate because it would help the legal department do X, Y, and Z uh, is something that would be looked upon uh, or, or you know, probably without as many welcoming uh, uh, eyes as, as you might imagine. And I, mean, I won't go into to details as far as any of the internal politics of it, but suffice to say, right, to focus on alignment and finding ways to empower people to use the technology themselves rather than to impose it or to, to sort of say we need this information from you creates pathways to adoption of things that might lead to dispute a reduction or empower business leaders to sort of make the decisions themselves. I think that's been a, a critical aspect of managing some of the changes and ensuring that you get a, a wider spread adoption and sort of the, I guess, being sensitive to the way that our, our particular culture would address problems and sort of working within that rather than trying to focus on technology and running from there. I love that approach, but you're, what I'm reading between the lines is, look, fundamentally, regardless of the new technology you're bringing in, people are people, and you got to make sure that you've got buy-in from everybody who's going to use it rather than the litigation department saying, hey, we need this for risk avoidance because that's not going to fly, right? Um, one of the things I've seen in the news, Amy, I'm going to focus this question on you. One of the things I've seen in the news recently is um, the EU going pretty <laughs> data privacy um, regulatory hard, shall we say. I know Google Analytics just got hit with some big decisions against it. Um, those two cases, I think it was Austria and one other, are part of 101 similar cases that have been filed by NLYB. And I just see that as a, um, 
a challenge with technology that we've got to address. I know you're on cutting edge with uh, data ethics. How does that fit in? Does it fit in? How can we basically avoid this kind of risk that we now see uh, the use of data information and violation of privacy bringing forth? Yeah, I think the regulations in the data privacy space have have um, have been uh, there and they are continuing to grow, uh, both in increasing pressure and, of course, as as we all might recall, the the hacking of Angela Merkel's cell phone tied with um, the Edward Snowden um, disclosures of uh, certain governments like ours <laughs> following other governments like hers. And in that regard, there has been uh, not only a global pressure increase because of that, including laws like GDPR, as well as uh, a more awareness. And I think with more awareness, there too has been consumer awareness of, um, sure, I know that you know my data is being used, but I didn't realize they were doing it for that, and so on and so forth. Um, will we come up with any good resolution? Probably not in the next few years. <laughs> I've been in that space now for nearly 20 and we're still going and going strong, I think there's a long way to go. But I think, Janice, to your point, um, for any number of reasons that are, are heating up that pot um, up to a temperature where it may boil um, and, and really come to a head on some of these things, data ethics in particular is, in my opinion, where uh, we as professionals, particularly in this space, are really beginning to, to do the turn and look at these evaluations. And I would ask those um, attending here too, and as you are putting forward technology to be thinking about data ethics. Um, in some of those areas that I mentioned, say insurance or financial, uh, we do have sectoral laws that, that do identify, look, you can't use data and of, of any sort to then uh, use it to discriminate, right? So as, as your credit card companies then target you for, um, for credit cards, they're doing that based on what they think your value is and your net worth and where you are and geographically and so on and so forth. Is that normatively the right thing? And as we as a society, is that what we really want to do? Um, and, and that is intertwined and, a certain, and certainly an indirect result of how companies end up using and relying more and more on uh, big data. So just as we put in some of these regular processes that evaluate uh, how we can be proactive going forward, like postmortems uh, after every meeting or after a big initiative or a litigation, so too ought companies to then put in the data ethics uh, gut check are our um, assumptions correct? Did we start out with the right questions to begin with? And is this the right thing to do? Just, you know, just with the keynote, um, it comes with a, a commercial cost, but, but we want to do the right thing. And what does that mean? And, and how far does it flow? And data ethics is, is um, a particular area that, um, that has not yet been fully developed, but that code and that framework um, can start with every company and will certainly be a big part of, of the dialogue in the next decade. I agree. And frankly, I'm out here in California on the West Coast. And, you know, we like to always enact statutes before everybody else. And we like to, you know, maybe it depends on where you sit from your perspective. It could be either, you know, going too far or not far enough, right? One of the things that I know we just put in place in California, effective January 1 of this year, was the genetics privacy regulation, which speaks right really to this very issue. All right, I'm gonna jump from ethics to money. Yep, we're gonna go money. What has really been worth it in terms of your bottom line? One technology that has impacted the company's bottom line in terms of risk cost savings. If you could name one, what would it be? Ken, let's hear from you. Well, since I do privacy, I'll, I'll start there, but uh, anyone who deals with privacy knows that the statutory damages could be astronomical. Uh, so I think it's extremely important to make sure that you know, any 
company that has a, a pricing program, uh, use the pricing software out there. Uh, and I think if you fail to do so, uh, it could be not just a reputational damage, but it could be a, a life-changing uh, statutory damage type of situation. So, uh, so since I do pricing, I'm going to have to build with pricing software. Chris, what do you say? Um, you know, I'll be totally honest. It's a, it's a little bit of a difficult question for me to answer specifically because we use a lot of our own technology. <laughs> and so um, we have a really deep stack from Azure and machine learning and AI down to BI and visualization. So I, you know, I, we don't spend a terrible, terrible amount on technology. So let me give you a, a slightly different perspective. And, and I would say, um, Two things. One is spending on, particularly in the, the bigger like global sense, spending on data openness and transparency and acquiring data um, and making sure you've got rich data sources. It's not cheap. And that we do have to spend on when we're certainly when we're working with governments. Um, it's, a, it's, you know, it's an enormous undertaking in a lot of cases to put together the kinds of big data sets you need to to solve a problem like beneficial ownership or conflict of interest detection. I mean, that is a multifaceted problem involving, you know, self-disclosure registries and, you know, tax records and corporate incorporation documents. So anyway, um, I, I'd say like that, that and, and at Microsoft, you know, we've learned that we need to spend on data fluency to people, like the people who actually can serve that critical bridge between the risk expert and the backend data and make that magical connection. Nick, what about you? Give us give us your money's worth. I don't know what would have had the biggest impact on our bottom line. And there's certainly several technologies in the defense space that I'm not gonna uh, uh, talk about in this forum. But one area that is has been you know very much worth the investment has been uh, and in part because it is the right thing to do, has been uh, and in technology related to mitigating the environmental impact of our operations, uh, both in a direct way in terms of advanced technologies that substantially reduce or uh, basically eliminate any sort of discharge related with ongoing manufacturing processes. Plus, the other thing we've done is in certain areas, uh, invested heavily in uh, mitigating remediation technology that is up beyond what is nece would necessarily be strictly required under the law in order to ensure that we sort of reduce the tail end risk associated with past uh, potential environmental issues that were caused by our legacy businesses many, many decades ago before people understood the potential environmental impacts of some of the chemicals that are used in the processes. I think those suite of technologies that we've invested in and deployed have, are, are going to pay off or already have paid off uh, many fold over the years by reducing environmental uh, litigation, reducing conflicts with government entities related to environmental cleanup and generally have put us in a, a very strong position to make sure that we you know, do the right thing uh, regarding the environment. You know, I love that because it brings right to mind the fact that Flint, Michigan is still going on right now because they didn't have in place any kind of monitoring of the downstream effects of the chemicals they were using. And so uh, the fact that General Dynamics is doing that even above what is legally required is fantastic and is going to avoid the kinds of lawsuits that have been going on for decades that we're seeing in Flint, Michigan, right? Um, let's turn it more personal. How has data affected your own department? Ken, let's start with you. Well, you know, I thought about this question quite a bit. It's, it's hard to answer because I think for all of us, uh, we, we are so used to increased Data. I mean, I mean, it's almost from from back from law school to now. Uh, I don't think we appreciate how, how much access we have to so much data, and so so it's one of the things where I think we will know if we lost it, but we are so accustomed to it, uh, accustomed to, to having so much information quickly uh, that, that I think we're just kind of got kind of spoiled where we could we could cross reference, uh, double check, uh, have you know, tremendous. Uh, relevant information quickly. Uh, so, so I think 
you know, I think you have to have whatever you whatever you do, you have to have these software tools and automation, and to the point where I think it just becomes part of how we function uh, and, and however we do it. I think it's all personalized. Chris, what do you want to say about that? How has the data automation affected your own department? I know you had DOT and a couple other uh, projects. Yeah, I'd say um, the, the, the most important, so, so to give you an, um, like an, an, an anecdote, I mean, we attempted to get more proactive in a couple of spaces, maybe four or five years ago, um, and based on learnings, right? We, we, we did the thing where, you know, you, as Amy said, you know, you, you get together as a manager and you're like, okay, what did we learn? What, you know, how did this, this investigation or this dispute or whatever you're looking at, how did it unfold? What were the critical failure points? And, um, and then, you know, you, you, can, you can fix with controls and then you're left with this question of like, okay, great. So now I'm energized. I understand this risk. I feel like I know it frontwards and backwards. I, I just don't know where to go next, right? And so you can take an audit-like approach and randomly sample, um, but it turns out that that it, it like the return on that work didn't feel like it was worth the time and investment. And on top of that, it had a sort of recursive like, well, we would we weren't successful, so you know, you know, it sort of deaccelerated the energy around it, and that trans that was transformed and and by by data. And by technology and by being able to not just sort of anecdotally or subjectively talk about a risk and what you learn from it, but then being able to actually have a team of people go in and model out as best we can where in the world to look next based on the fact pattern or the proxies for the risk or whatever we come up with. Um, and the, the, the difference in that program between then and now has just been amazing. I find that fascinating because yeah, I mean, you identify a risk. So like now what, right? <laughs> and what you're doing is is very cutting edge in terms of not just finding risk factors, but coming up with areas that you can then avoid going forward. And I'd say one more thing too. I'd say like yes. vert vertically integrating on that that process has been just as critical for us. So not if you have to wait in line two weeks or a month or six weeks to get uh, an answer on an analytics question in the middle of a, a sprint to understand a risk in the field, right? Like that, that just kills, that kills your momentum as well. So like building those functionalities into the proactive team also been really important for us. So we can do real time, you know, 24 hour turnaround on all the, this stuff, this stuff is never straight line, right? It's always curving. And so being able to answer and re-straighten your course uh, in the middle of something is, is critical too. It, it is, I mean, it, you know, too little too late doesn't help you, right? Uh, Nick, chime in here uh, from a legal department that you run, uh, how has data automation affected your department? One thing that we've uh, been able to do is adopt uh, new and better ways of analyzing uh, and taking apart our legal spend uh, on principally on outside uh, counsel. And we've been able to, through that, find ways of taking costs out of, of matters and better, um, better managing them. I mean, one example is we uh, were able to see patterns of where uh, teams, uh, outside counsel teams were sort of imbalanced. They had the wrong level of resources on things which drove up a cost higher either by having redundant reviews or by just allocating the work to sort of the wrong level of attorney, which then um, you know, either required, required additional work to be done or just was too expensive of a resource on something. We would not have been able to see that subjectively just by reviewing bills the way that we ordinarily do, but having some data uh, analysis on top of it helped uh, do that. Uh, so that's one sort of concrete way. And of course, anytime you look closely at legal spend, you are uh, heavily incentivized to try to avoid disputes in the future. Amen. <laughs> I can say that for sure. All right. Everybody put your crystal balls in full focus. I'm going to give us our last question. And if we have time, we'll open it up for some audience questions. I know the chat's been blowing up. They probably want to get at you. Um, predictions. All right, 
Experts are telling us and predicting that we're going to see more technological advances in the next decade than we've seen in the entire past century, right? You know, the pandemic has, has taught us that uh, in the last couple of years. Given our world's accelerated data transformation, what area do each of you predict will see the greatest advancements in terms of preventing disputes over the next five years? So get your crystal ball out. Ken, what do you think? Well, I think I'm a big fan of AI, so so I've kind of seen some of it, and and I think as we we move along, we'll see what what products, uh, what are the um, risks that are involved with any, any new products and any new um, offerings that people do. Uh, so so I see that I see that literally you can just kind of look at a new product, uh, put in some some information, and it'll give you all the different risks and. and all the different statutes and which which states would do what deal with it however uh so so i know it sounds very futuristic but uh you know i definitely see the world going to that direction absolutely you know let's not forget what hg wells the the bomb <laughs> and he predicted that like i don't know 1930 or something and here we are all right amy what do you see on the horizon? Um, well, I do think AI is probably a big part of it, but since Ken already took that one, I'll pick something else. Um, what I would say is this, um, and this is an observation in the industry that I'm currently in, as well as the industry that I was previously in, when it relates to technology, there have been a lot of disaggregated or disparate um, functions in different areas of tech, whether or not it's looking at the technology itself or whether or not it's looking at the way in which a company or organization uses it. And I'm seeing a lot of consolidation related to that. And so if I were to make a prediction, um, which I hate doing because, you know, lawyers and predictions and the like, um, uh, I would say that there, there will be continued consolidation of that because as the companies continue to use them and the pressure exists to make sure that that integration occurs, you'll see industries um, more closely evolve uh, that with the consolidation in place. So that that's going to be my two cents. Thank you. All right, Nick, your crystal ball. What do you got for us? Well, I, I uh, don't pretend to follow every development in technology, and I am quite confident that I know less than any of my uh, fellow panelists about uh, the technology that exists now and that will come in the future. But one thing I'm uh, uh, very much I think I do know is that technology is a lot like the law, uh, which is to say it is only good to the extent it is put to good use. Uh, and we're going to see a lot of new developments. We don't know what they are. Um, and a lot of time as you look past uh, at our current state of affairs or, or you know, our past, uh, techno new technologies are not used uh, for good, but to gain advantage or to consolidate advantages that were already gained. And like, what my hope is that the you know, thoughtful lawyers like the folks attending this conference and our colleagues uh, can hopefully, as we see and learn about new technologies, can find ways of bringing them to bear to help resolve disputes and reduce uh, disputes and put people back towards a uh, you know proper purpose rather than just fighting over uh, uh, you know uh, the remains. So, but I you know I don't know that's not as much of a prediction as much as a hope. Well, but it's good to have hope, right? I mean, you want things to come out in a way that are going to be used positively instead of the kind of conflict we see in in the Ukraine right now. Um, before I get to Chris. I want to give the, the other CLE word very appropriately, data. The word is data. All right, for those of you wanting CLE, be sure to write that down. Chris, crystal ball, what is going to really catch your eye over the next five years in terms of dispute prevention? So I was thinking about this as everyone was answering, really great, great answers. Um, I, I'd say, I'll say one thing on the like big like nascent tech front, but I but I think I have a little bit of a contrary answer overall. So if I had to just pick one, like what's the home run dispute resolution thing that's going to happen, I'd probably say it's natural language processing. So engines like um, GPT three and these incredible advances in making sense of the massive words that 
currently is the sort of like by far the largest data we've said we said we have um, mm -hmm. from a risk management perspective at a company, whether it's contract parsing or it's like I said, you know, piecing together disparate words, you know, in different documents that together when you see them in, in, in the way that they're being connected, right, reveal something really important about a conflict of interest, or I think advances in that kind of like automated word process in the natural language space are going to be really important. But I, but I'd also say like, I think the biggest advances are probably it's it's sort of a weak link game, in the sense that like it's not about what's the coolest strongest thing, um, particularly on the government space where we have so much work to do to catch up in a lot of places um, on the bad guys. Um, you know, I think, you know, improving those weak links where we don't have very much tech, we're very privileged in the corporate world, particularly the company like Microsoft and all the companies that, you know, my co-panelists work at to have resources and, and capabilities that doesn't exist in a lot of places. And I think we're going to see a lot of fixing of that in the next five years. And it's going to really lead to some serious gains um, via the introduction of even basic tech. Wow, I hope that comes true. Um, I'm going to take one point of privilege since I do serve on the emerging technology uh, panel and that and I'm a, one of those little womp types. Um, I'm going to predict genetics based, based healthcare. I'm going to say that with the whole advances of technology in healthcare, we're going to start to get individualized um, diagnosis and individualized protections and cures based on individual genetics. Okay, so hit me up in five years and tell me if I was even close. All right, um, let me turn it over to Ellen. But before I do, I gotta say so much. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, it was fascinating. And, and Chris, probably every other word I understood, and it was fascinating because you've got so much experience in terms of actual technology that you're living in the moment and all of you nick with the legal perspective amy with the huge wonderful data ethics piece ken privacy and intellectual property i cannot thank you enough for sharing all your uh, insights with us today ellen go ahead if we have time for some questions from the audience i don't know if we're out of time but no, i would love to see you're good. We do have we have some time, and I have one question. If you're all game, um, and I, I just wanted to say, and it was pointed out to me um, on, on the CLE thing. So everybody, keep track. These were codes one and two that you got. Um, the form has them by number. So if you're not participating in each panel, you ought to just make sure we'll tell the other um, moderators to uh, to give you the number for the code for the form. And I think there was an issue with the form. So um, keep track on a separate piece of paper and at the end of the conference, add them, then you can fill it out. So, um, so thanks. And uh, Janice, I had a question uh, and, and the question was, I think it was Chris who said that risk comes from contracts, bad deals and bad relationships. How, how do you use technology or, or any of the others to identify where risk will likely arise from relationships? That's a great question. That was actually Nick, what he was saying was oh, that, okay. that they use data in his department to kind of prevent some of the root causes. Do you wanna take the first swing at that, Nick? Sure, and I think relationships are a good example. And you know, it isn't just here in the law department, but throughout our company, uh, we try to, and, and this is something that, that Chris had commented on, which is to try to make sure that the business owner that has the risk is also the one using the technology. And, and uh, to, But what we try to do uh, with respect to relationships is uh, do upfront um, right screening of who we do business with. And you know, we do that in a lot of different ways, including ensuring that there's the right capability uh, there. But one of the things we use is uh, technology-aided um, due diligence, which would help aggregate information about counterparties and provide us uh, uh, with some additional context and data points in order to make a risk-weighted decision as to whether or not it's a, a relationship we want to be in. 
uh, and then obviously you gotta continue to, to make good decisions once you're in that relationship as well. I, I like that thought. I, I wanted to, uh, well, Ellen, maybe you can go ahead, ask Dawn's question. I think that's a, put, a very important one. Um, that'd one. be great. And actually, you know, trying to make this a little more interactive, if Dawn would like to ask it, you can unmute yourself. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Oh, well, I was addressed. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my question to the panel really is, um, I've heard a lot of great uh, discussion about all the advantages technology brings, but when when serving in risk management in a large organization, how do you address what I'll call the running with scissors syndrome, the rapid development, deployment, and implementation of technologies before all the regulatory niceties have been solved? I'd be happy to take that first because <clears throat> Is At least all of, the products that, all of the products that I've been putting out um, have this whole significant overlay of data privacy that um, that treats every single piece of what we sell um, in in singular as well as in totality um, as part of these this gray area. I'll say this as a process. Um, you know, the notion that you walk, you crawl before you walk, you walk before you run is always a good approach for all of us. We all know the deployment of that new software that we work you know, for our, our own organizations that didn't go well and then we're all dead in the water. Um, and so that that is, um, as anybody in the tech industry is aware, a great chance to implement that beta testing, that um, you know, gold, gold master type of whichever words you use uh, the crawl, the walk, the run. And then when it comes to running with scissors, when you take a look at the overlay, I mean, I will say this, that that is what I believe makes my role strategic in these companies. Um, when I work with the CEO who wants to understand how the teams don't have to run around with scissors, and it's not just a risk perspective. Frankly, it's a business proposition. We don't need people like Chris <laughs> spending all of his time um, dealing with all of these things when he could have alternatively um, set uh, either a low or a high watermark that aligns the teams with the North Star principle. And, and at least for my teams, I set out the North Star principle. This is our collective risk that we're willing to take. Here are the laws that we know today. Here are the trends we think are going to happen. We're going to run. And at least with everybody having that North Star principle in um, at play, we all can still run in the same direction. We can all still anticipate in the same direction. We at least understand and are on the same page of the risk profile that we're willing to take um, and, and go from there. And actually on, on Microsoft's side, North Star principle was uh, the way in which Microsoft was able on behalf of an entire industry um, to put together what then became their new Xbox system when um, for the first time ever visuals and visual information was starting to be ingested across the board. And so how do you create these standards for an entire industry without the technology even being developed, let alone the regulation? North Star philosophy was, was, um, was there, so hat, hats off to Microsoft. Nick, you probably have some um, thoughts on this too, on the tech, on the technology and the application side. Certainly. I mean, I think that it is always a, a difficult proposition, but it's one that, you know, we, uh, we are a, a company that, that is very focused on sort of mature governance processes. And, you know, to a certain extent, frankly, that may slow down the, the, deployment of some technologies, but we have uh, a, a very sophisticated risk management process that does exactly what Amy uh, is talking about, which is to try to illuminate what the risks are, elevate them to the right level within the company of senior management, and let them know, right, you either are taking on this risk and you've bought it as a senior uh, business decision maker, or um, you don't want to take that risk and, and then let people make those decisions. Obviously, there are some bright lines that you that right you can't make decisions that are illegal 
but in this space, as we, as Don points out, a lot of times we don't know what that's going to be. And the law department's role and our risk management uh, structures uh, is designed to do is elevate that and put it into the decision makers uh, uh, hands with the right information about where the trends might be and let them make the decision about uh, what level of risk the corporation is willing to take. Uh, sort of the exact process that Amy described, that's the way that we try to do it uh, across our different platforms, uh, regardless of, uh, you know, sort of how mature the technology is. You know, I that reminds me of a situation that I dealt with where I think timing is also an important piece because, you know, I had, um, uh, I won't name the name, but it's a bio um, medical device to monitor um, diabetes glucose levels. And so at the beginning, when they were wanting to get to market before anybody else, I advise them being willing to take more risks so that they could get out there. But now that they're on sixth generation, right? And they're coming out with, you know, number seven. And honestly, number seven has so many kinks. I said, no, no, you don't have to come out with number seven yet. You can wait until it's perfected because the timing is such that they're already established. And so they don't need to come out with seven just to beat somebody else. Um, anyway, enough, enough. I just, it, Don's question really hit home for me on that. Um, other questions from the audience, please unmute yourself and ask or jump in the conversation, guys. So, so not not wanting to, to dominate, but something Nick said prompted further thought, which is the importance of having a real clear communication between the people identifying the risk or, or in the product development and getting that to people at your level, Nick, in a, in a transparent way and, and how an organization can make sure that, you know, the pressures to get to market that Janice is talking about isn't interfering with an objective assessment of the risks that have to be addressed before you get to market and the, 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 the tension that really exists between the development and the protection of the business. How do you, how do, you do that in, in such a large organization? Well, one thing that we think a lot about, uh, and it's one thing that you know we have uh, and we're blessed to have a really uh, spectacular culture at several of our business units that are focused on this. I mean, if you go to uh, the electric boat uh, company, one of our uh, subsidiaries, they build uh, nuclear submarines uh, for the Navy. Um, it is a, a near religion at that uh, company, the safety of the sailor and the precision of uh, of, of the engineering and the work that goes into creating, you know, big hunks of metal that are meant to go up and down underneath the water and not kill people. Uh, it is uh, uh, a an absolute um, obsession there to be to put safety first and to put uh, the the engineering and the correct steps first uh, before anything else. It doesn't matter. Schedule is not the most important thing, and you know uh, a. The key item for them is to execute in a way that can make them proud and that they can be proud of, of the product that we eventually deliver to the US Navy. And it is driven principally by culture, not by technology and not by anything else, but by the sort of uh, what is inculcated across our workforce. Uh, I think that's probably the, the number one way that we, uh, we achieve that. And, and it, but it is something that we certainly think a lot about and I know our, our senior uh, executive uh, business leadership thinks a lot about how do we ensure those risks go up the chain and people are making the right decisions. And that's one of the reasons that we focus so much on culture. I have to say one of the things that speaks directly to this is a dispute prevention tool that I put in place at another company, again, not going to name it, where we created a position called the messenger. The messenger's job was to deliver the bad news with and that was their job that's what they're paid to do and the messenger had a direct pipeline to the board 
and to all of the senior management team. So that if someone had a, something in a department and they're afraid to speak up to it, they can confidentially go tell the me messenger and the messenger will make sure that the message is delivered without um, being killed, basically. Anyway, I'm sure, Ellen, are we out of time? I could just ask you guys questions all day long and I know that um, we, it's we, fascinating. We, we're, we're good, we, we can actually do one more question. Oh, lovely. If, if you'd like, yes. Homer, and Homer has his hand up. Please. Uh, very interesting. You've talked a lot about technology and the risks and avoiding risks. I wonder to what extent comes into your thinking the notion of some of our seemingly intractable issue, social issues, uh, including all parts of our society in various aspects. How does technology, how do you think about technology in relationship to those issues or are those something on the side that unrelated to, to technology? Great question. Who wants to jump in on that? I'm happy to take a quick stab. I, I do think that they're related. Um, and I'll say this um, in, in response to a fairly philosophical question. In, in part, I'll respond with a philosophical response, which is to say, it is my view that technology has made information accessible across the globe in a way that previously it was, it was curated with certain expectations at hand and whether or not that expectation what was or did include research or whether or not it was a certain type of typography, curation, the way it was um, presented uh, and by that, I mean, you know, um, homogeneity or otherwise, it just was. And these days we have the opportunity to explore that, but it has also blown up all of those fundamental precepts. So whether or not that information is or is not curated, how that's curated, in what way the information is presented, whether or not that information is um, validated and in what benchmarks we as human beings and as a society actually benchmark itself, has been up for debate for a long time, um, certainly in the last few years in particular as it comes to us. So I do think that, that it, you know, that's the way, in my opinion, technology um, relates to culture. And I see that especially in my work on the DEI &E space, not just for companies and in particular public companies as their data metrics happen, but also just in, in a professional, I guess, personal capacity on DEI initiatives where we too see um, consequences of um, historical presentation and current presentation, um, historical um, expectations around what that is and what is possible and what is available to the communities today. And, and I'll jump in real quick. <clears throat> so um, a friend of mine told me this really, really interesting story about the fact that we have too much data sometimes. And he'll explain to me from an HR perspective where uh, when you get a resume, you know, it, you, it, it's your duty to make sure you look at their social media accounts and see what they, see what they do. However, by looking at that, you, you want to see things that aren't necessarily just in the four corners of the resume. You want to see, a, you know, their, their background and other things that shouldn't be in the consideration. So how do you make sure you do due diligence, but not be subject to, to you being uh, subject to uh, using information that you really shouldn't have looked at? And he explained to me, he's like, you know, you have to create a firewall. You have to have one group that will look at just the qualification, a separate group will look at the social media account and make sure that the information that's exchanged is limited. So I think, you know, we live in a world where in some ways we, we almost have too much data and, and we have to learn how to, to, to uh, manage it, control it, uh, and make sure that what you put into the data is not things that you shouldn't be really considering when you make decisions. Well, we've proven that, you know, the data is only as good as the input so that when um, AI reads newspapers, it itself, it's a computer <laughs> program adopted implicit bias because what it read was implicitly biased. And, and we have that program Friday afternoon. Absolutely. <laughs> so Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think um, 
I think this question can can feed an entire another panel discussion, um, and, and and I'd love to. Uh, I, I I absolutely do. Um, so I'm I'm gonna be in touch <laughs> with with you all um, because I think that is another way to look at you know it, it's another important topic, and um, but we I do need to turn to the next um, part of the program to keep us on track. Um, so I, I also want to extend a huge thanks to um, to the five of you, Janice, Amy, Chris, Ken, and Nick. Um, this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much.